Greetings everyone and welcome to this new series of videos. I am Alessandro, also known as Dark Ages Workshop on the internet. Due to the high requests I received on social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, Discord and Reddit, I'll be making a series of painting tutorials in which I'll be sharing with you my personal understandings and the basics of grimdark painting and the whole mentality behind it. This is aimed both at beginners and those with an already advanced understanding of miniature painting that are curious enough to see my approach on the matter. Now, I don't consider myself to be a perfect painter in any way, but I think I'm a decent observer and I'm really passionate when it comes to creating a narrative. And in my personal opinion, these are pretty much necessary factors when it comes to achieving good results by painting in a grimdark style be it for a war game, a small skirmish game, or a modeling project of any kind. There is a lot of great, easy to access Grindart painting tutorials on the internet already. But what I'm proposing here with my series is a personal explanation of the whole process, the way I do it. I'll be covering the mindset and mental work that I go through when I'm starting my projects products I'm using, and finally, some practical demonstration, all in one place. This video in particular will focus on the mindset and everything I do before even assembling the miniature. It is highly suggested that, with these informations, you will leave your fears and doubts behind and experiment and find your own personal way. The style doesn't require a particularly high level of skill, but having an understanding of the products and a clear view of the world you want to represent is kind of necessary. Now, get comfortable, get immersed and inspired into this grimdark journey. What I associate with this term is the concept of struggle. The hardships of war, brutality, barbarism, fanaticism, the loss of personal values and feelings that lead to nihilism, the squalor and degeneracy, the abysmal conditions of the characters involved, and the inability to clearly distinguish good from evil in a grey, dystopian world that is the brink of insanity. When talking about war games, Warhammer 40,000 is the game that made the stern somewhat famous. By far, the fourth edition of Warhammer 40k is the one I'd consider the most grimdark of all. The wonderful illustrations by John Blanche, Kopinski, Gallagher, Boyd, Smith portray this outright terrible world, leaving no room for doubt. The incredible sensation of movement, the chaotic maelstrom of flesh and machine, muzzle flashes explode from all directions, while statuary, inhuman figures stand stoic before a naked tomb of life forms, destroyed in body and soul. An arcane, weird technology, powered by unspeakable entities that propose practicality and an aesthetic appropriate to the cause before any form of common sense. Mordheim, the city of the damned, is another pinnacle of grimdark art, narrative and gameplay. The events are narrated by the point of view of cynical mercenaries and superstitious citizens, falling in despair for the literal end of the world. A twin-tailed comet crashed on the city, destroying countless lives. Many see it as a punishment sent by God Sigma for a life of debauchery and demon worshipping, almost as a biblical event akin to Sodom and Gomorrah. All sorts of squalid raiders, the worst scum of the Empire of Man, the undead, the filthy ratmen, degenerate chaos worshippers and religious zealots fight each other to ransack the city of all the remaining fragments of the comet, each with their own personal agenda. With iron in hand, it proves right, no matter the cost. All of this 
is represented massively in the art of the rule book, where both the marginalia and boards of the book were presented with an unspeakable amount of malformed folk with elongated arms, soon mouths, and purposely wrong anatomy as to represent their extreme mental and physical condition. They are often portrayed in seemingly nonsensical acts and poses, performing parades and dances similar to the illustrations of medieval dance macabre. And everything is crowned by masterfully hidden alchemical and occult meanings behind every board. Roofs, houses, and overall geometry immediately feel wrong to the eye appearing twisted, weird, and labyrinthic. Even speaking about gameplay, Mordheim is the epitome, the ultimate paradigm of grimdark design. Every weapon is lethal, every encounter can be deadly. If your warriors get injured, they risk losing an eye, an arm, their sanity, or become scarred or enslaved. Now, this is not a more than review or analysis, but I felt this little overview was necessary in order to explain what ultimately defines the grimdark art and aspect to me. If you currently lack inspiration, there's a world of incredible imagery and color palettes and subjects you can find in paintings and illustrations throughout history, from medieval to late romantic to modern times, and also modern media and video games. These are just a few out of infinite examples. I feel it's important at this point to state that it doesn't matter which universe you're going to use as a setting, as long as you're understanding and including at least some of these features, you can create all sorts of green dark universes. There are countless great game systems and brands of miniatures that you can use for your games or modeling purposes, while still narrating a grimdark story. It is essential that you have a clear idea of the world around your models. It doesn't matter if it's pre-existing or made from scratch. The characters should be an extension of it. Seek out to mirror the hardships of the world on to the models, their struggle and their motives. I strongly suggest searching on the internet for references before starting an important project. They will be of great help when you build and then paint your models. Seek for keywords and do some brief brainstorming. For this instance, I will show you a mood board I made for my small Death Guard army. For my Death Guard, I wanted to distance myself from what is usually proposed from the box art and a typical oozing green slime thing. I wanted them resembling trench fighters coming out of the sludge. Them and their primitive weapons called black rough with rust and crusted deposits, their backpacks fume black smog like they're some morbidly gross industrial factories marching slowly on two legs, their armors on flesh, almost shaking and trembling, unable to contain such a disgusting amount of mud-bloated organs, are they filled to the brim and ready to explode at any moment. Ask yourself some questions when designing your miniatures. What type of technology is present in this world? And what is the availability of it? Who are or were these people before? What have they been through? What are they fighting? One question leads to another. And in little time, we can create great context that will help you being consistent throughout the whole project. Now we're going to discuss the next step, which is bringing all what we said onto the actual model. Imagine your character's surroundings. A cobblestone city, a ruined gothic entrance, 
sewers, a filthy starship, or perhaps an alien planet. Remember that a nice base can tell a nice story. Don't overcomplicate it, just use the right amount of storytelling. Bricks, debris, or an overgrown forest are just some of the many options. I tend to use simple half centimeter thick cork sheets. I reduce that thickness with my hoping knife and create different heights and can make for an interesting base with a sensation of movement. Then I use all sorts of scraps or plastic bits and pieces. Bricks made with a green stuff roller onto millipot of dust clay. You can also make bricks from pieces of spruce. Then I glue my bottle to the base and apply some earth texture. You can use whatever pre-made texture you want, or make your own with spackle or wood filler, with the addition of PVA glue and some sand. Plus the kits will let you easily create your own custom model. With the addition of 3D printed parts, you can add lots of character and visual information. Don't overdo it. Sometimes also a simple head or weapon swap can make a significant impact. I often find that replacing huge, oversized weapons with the more believable, realistic and down-to-earth ones can really change the tone and feel of the scene. It all comes down to the view of the world you're trying to convey and if you're able to justify it. Is it normal for common militia to wield such weaponry? Is it the standard to have a warband or a model? armed to the teeth, wearing plate armor, towering above anyone else like a stormcast or a space marine. There is no right or no wrong to these questions. The only limit is your imagination. As long as you can keep it coherent with the narrating, everything is fine. If in your mind it's epic, grandiose and grimdark, so be it. In this particular case, for this miniature, I wanted a game world similar to that of Dark Souls or Elden Ring. I gave him a hood, and sculpted a beard, and used a real miniature chain to make a flail. This one is a jailer for my Witch Hunter's warband for Mordheim. I used a wheel him to carry as a weapon, similarly to the Breaking Wheel Demon of the Manga Berserk, or the Logarius Breaking Wheel from Bloodborne. I want my Witch Hunters to stick with the aesthetic of the More Than Rulebook, but I added some personal interpretation. I really wanted them cruel and making use of instruments of torture on the battlefield. A general advice for me would be to bring down some of the high fantasy elements in favor of more gritty, low-level ones. Scale down the epicness in favor of the mundane. In case you're not planning to change anything from the model, that is completely fine. Sometimes it's good to do something stress-free like building a model as it's intended. Rust, dirt, Mud deposits have an important role in the grimdark style, as well as battered and weathered clothing, tarnished weapons and armor. Representing characters in sanitized and pristine conditions isn't ideal, as you really want to show the gritty aspect of the world around them, as we said before. An optional thing you could do is come with a pointy tool and start applying some light scratching and chipping, giving texture to an otherwise flat area. This can also help hide the 3D printing line and resin models, such as this creek looking ogling. Holes, scratches and filing, and applying a matte texture on the lowest parts of the model can add interesting storytelling and visual information. Don't overdo it, you can always add, but going back is gonna be a hard task. Consider if it's the case to hide or cancel some of these details, 
for a more twisted and grotesque appearance. Let the sculpt speak to you. By the time, you would ideally have a nice background foundation to model your characters or set of figures, ready to be based, prepped and painted. In a later video we will reiterate some of these last concepts and add some more, while showing everything more clearly. The next video, part 2, will focus on the tools of the trade. I will teach you everything you have to know to work properly with acrylics, oils, enamels and all the respective uses and properties. We're approaching the end of the video. I hope you find this video interesting, informative and inspiring, no matter its skill or knowledge. I'd like to take a brief moment to thank all of my Ko-Fi supporters and those who donated. This video was also made thanks to you. The link is in the description. In case you can afford, I will deeply and humbly appreciate. Also, I'd like to thank Hiem's Anime, who composed the original score for this channel. And also Stefano from Chimera Wargaming for guiding me in my first steps here on YouTube. Subscribe, comment and share to help me get this journey to a wider audience. Farewell and see you soon, Initiates.